my name is Asker, and um, I grew up in Western Jutland, where there was a lot of uh, yeah, religion. Um, and uh, early on, I, I found role-playing games and uh, games and board games, and that became uh, my, my, my big thing, like my little bubble that I could uh, escape into and uh, create wonderful things. And uh, then, 20 years after that, I ran into this guy who grew up somewhere else in... Actually, Klosdrup, right outside Copenhagen. And um, I ran around uh, illustrating and drawing stuff. And um, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, after 20-some years doing uh, commercial work, I was lucky enough to run into this guy. And uh, yeah, and we, we, we came with each our little bubble, and they merged. And that was, uh, that was very wonderful, and it still is. So that is uh, what we'll talk about today. That was a brief introduction of Snor. He will now sit down because we have this one microphone. He will later stand up to answer questions. <laughs> okay? I'll try to make this work. Amazing. Yes, so we founded Plotmaker Games in 2014. We met for that cup of coffee in 2013. And uh, the logo came into being shortly after. And as you can see, it is a pilot. Um, and we like that logo very much. It's uh, because the pilot to us is that creative explorer that ventures out into the world, constantly looking for new worlds and new places. So uh, it was a uh, little Aska and little Snor. We felt that that pilot lived inside us since we were kids. And now it, it has become one pilot. So. <laughs> And uh, like I said, this is the first game that we released. It released at Gen Con 2016. And to those of you who don't know what Gen Con is, that is the biggest gaming convention in the States. And um, we're now creating a lot more games, but that is the first, first game we made. And we'll try to take you through that uh, journey today to give you a, a peek behind the scenes of how that game came into being. And the theme being fantasy, we twisted that a little, little bit, so it's a story more than fantasy. I guess you can say, depending on how you perceive the, the notion fantasy, the, the, it has to do with fantasy, but a nerd like me, when I hear fantasy, I think barbarians and elves. And, but as a broader category, fantasy is storytelling, so that will be the topic. And then... Um, as some of you may know, board games are on the rise. Uh, board games, we found some articles. Uh, a lot of articles came out these past two years talking about the rise of board games. The Guardian had a, a nice article called The Rise and Rise of Board Games. And uh, as you can see here in Rise, it's official, everyone. Board games are cool now, which is a nice thing to know when you grew up with it being very nerdy. Uh, so uh, it is cool now. Uh, and uh, there are probably a lot of reasons for that. Uh, when we think board games, we think about maybe Monopoly and Risk and Ludo and Uno and all those games we played when we were kids. Um, and something is happening to board games these days. They're becoming much more uh, mainstream. And uh, there are probably a lot of reasons for that. One of them it has been suggested is we're moving away from the digital and we want to do something that is not in front of a computer. And that is, uh, that is probably true, but I think there's also something else going on. I think it is simply a new way of, of communicating because if we look at the, the, the board games that we play now, they're very different from, from the board games that we, we used to play. At least some of them are. Um, When we, in, when we talk board games, we, have, we can, we can distinct, distinguish between two very broad categories. And like with any kind of map, the map is never the territory, as we say. So of course, this is not entirely true, but it is still a good distinction. We talk about Euro games versus a merry trash games, or abstract games versus thematic games. Abstract games are like chess. The, the, the fun thing about an abstract game is the mechanics. You're trying to 
typically outsmart your opponent by understanding or using the rules better than your opponent. So chess is a classic example of an abstract game. And they have been around for probably as long as humanity has been around. Um, and you can say there is some theme in chess. It's a war game. But then again, not really. I remember when I was a kid trying to, when the first time I heard that, tried to really play it as a war game. Yeah, I have my knights and it doesn't really work because you lose after five draws. So, and the other category of, of games is what we call thematic games or a merry trash games. And as you've probably figured out, someone else named them a merry trash games. Uh, but I, I, I kind of like that title. It's because they, they came from America originally and it's, it's trash because it's not fine mechanics or it used to be more sloppy mechanics than chess. Chess is, of course, very beautiful and, and the, the mechanics are are perfectly aligned. And with thematic games or merry trash games, the, the purpose is not to have the perfect mechanics, even though that is also part of it, but the, the purpose the, where you have fun is the experience, the story. You live through a story. And I think that is something new is definitely happening, happening here with board games, that we see board games being used to tell a story. Um, if you look back, we had a um, the Star of Africa, Africa Star, Africa Stian, that game, that told a little bit of a story of Marco Polo, or there was some story in it, but it was very, like, painted on uh, some uh, mechanics, where with a trend we're seeing, or with the new board games, the new thematic board games, you really see an endeavor to try to tell a story with a game, and I think that's, that's really the new thing, and, and that is not necessarily moving away from technology because a lot of games actually use apps now and even our game comes with an app. It can be to enhance the storytelling. So we use all the, the tools we have to try to tell a story. And I think we've, this, is, we haven't, this is just the beginning of what we, what we will see with board games and, and technology. So, um, yeah, so, so the point is something is, is definitely happening with, happening with board games. And, uh, the thing that is happening is that we, they, they are trying to tell stories. And um, there's, a, there's a trend now called legacy games. I don't know if you heard that term. Where the, the idea of a legacy game is that you can only play it one time. Because when you play it, as you play through it, you tear apart cards or you open little packs. If you win this, you open this pack. And if you lose, you throw it out without looking at it. So it's a one-time experience. And five years ago, Nobody believed in that. It was people are not going to pay fifty or hundred dollars for for an experience that they can just play once. I mean, Monopoly, I can play it over and over again. But that has definitely changed. So, so now board games are they are becoming like a cultural experience, like going to the movies or watching a, a TV series or watching a play. That has that has definitely changed, and it's, it it continues to change. So board games, and you, escape rooms is another example of that. You can now buy escape rooms as board games. So you know you're only supposed to play them one time. But we want to do that, and, and, and we want to do it in a social context. Yeah, we talk a lot more about that, but I think that that's, that's more uh, the core of what's happening rather than it is moving away from technology. Uh, another thing that's happening with board games that happened around uh, the new millennium is the idea of a cooperative board game. It's an idea of that you can play a board game, you always play them together, but now you can play them together against the game. So we team up and we try to beat the game. And that is a, a big trend in, in these thematic games, in these storytelling games, where, we, where the game itself becomes an interactive, social experience where a team of, of friends live through a story and try to beat the game or play against the game. And as you, uh, when we talk about that, you can already hear that the goal is not so much to beat the game. It's also the goal, but it's just, it's also having fun it's, and, and being together as a group. So that's, a, th that's really a new thing that you would go out and buy a game, which is an experience that you'll have with three friends and you live through a story. 
whether you win or lose, that's not the important thing. The important thing is if the, that the experience was, uh, was good, just as if you go to the movies. And um, the first one came out, I think it was 2001, that was The Lord of the Rings. And then Pandemic came out in 2009, maybe you know that title. That already sold one and a half million copies or something. So that, that's, that's really the mainstream cooperative game right now. And all this to say that uh, we, we, when we set out to make our first game, we wanted to make a cooperative game, a truly cooperative game. Um, and, and, and because actually Pandemic, you could say that that is a solo game, it's a, because it's, you can play just one person. You can also play it more, but actually one person can, can dictate everything that happens. And in, in the board game lingo, that is known as the alpha player problem, that you have four friends trying to play a game, but that's actually one saying. And, it, and, it, and the way it works is this. You could do what you're trying to do. It's up to you. If you do this, we will win, but, but you, you, you could do it. Okay, I'll just do what you told me. So, and, 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 and right now we, we, we're looking at ways to overcome that. Um, and the, the way, the, the, what we use in London Dread is something we stole from a, a brilliant game called Space Alert. We use a time pressure mechanism where you simply, and that's where the app comes in, we use 12 minutes. So you have 12 minutes to play the game or coordinate and plan your movements around the city of London. So simply it's impossible for one player to dictate because you don't have the time and the resources to have all the information. So that's a, a mechanical trick to try to actually give people a better experience. I'm already running late here. So. Um, and, uh, okay, so that was a little bit about board games. <laughs> and uh, w what we're supposed to talk about is this fantasy and story and how we create that. And as you can see, we're we are, we are exploring a lot of new worlds. Uh, we have the pilot in the middle and he's, he's constantly flying out to find uh, uh, new worlds. So, th so those are some of the games that we, we, uh, we have in the pipeline. And uh, the way we explore these worlds is, uh, I guess anyone who's been part of creative process knows that feeling. It's, it's very difficult to talk about, but uh, I, I have a quote here. It's good to bring quotes when you do these kind of things. And uh, the guy is called Jesse Shell. I don't know if you know him. He, he used to do game design for Disney. And he, he, he wrote a wonderful book called The Art of Game Design. If you ever want to design games, you must buy and read that book, The Art of Game Design. He says that the, most, the, the game designer's most important skill is the ability to listen. And I think he means a couple of things with that. But to us, the most important thing is that what is it that we are listening for? And in Snores, in my case, we're listening for the story. We're trying to listen for that story that makes the world and the characters in the universe something that's interesting to us. So it's about a kind of gut feeling. But as with any creative process, it's a, it's a constant knowing and not knowing or trying to do something but not doing too much. So, so I love that quote. So the way we explore these game worlds, and we'll see a little bit ab uh, about that for London Dread, is that we, we simply try to listen for something interesting. And then, uh, yeah, you don't know what, what comes out of it, and you don't know what, what, what it is, but uh, like Socrates, he said he had that little demon in his ear that uh, it didn't tell him what to do. It, didn't, it, tell, it told him what he shouldn't do. And it's kind of that process. Yeah, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. But you, in that process, you're, you're, you're steering towards a goal where the magic happens and the, the game world is just there. And then when that happens, it's no longer your world or it's, it has its own laws. And, and from there on, it's, it's actually pretty easy to finish a game or a game world because you just do what the world tells you to do. So let's go through some of the... Oh, I just want to take you through that process of how London Dread came into being. We, 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 as I said, we, we knew we wanted to do a cooperative game. We, we knew we wanted to do an experience where people would come together, live through a story, and have fun. 
And as a game designer, it's my job to mechanically make that work. And as an artist, it's Snore's job to aesthetically make that thing work. So we listen for the same thing, but coming from two different directions, we try to, to make that work. So we, and this was when we first started to listen. We had vampires and monsters and something, and then that didn't sound quite right. So that was, we started out with the, yeah, Lovecraft and uh, a lot of the things we already knew. But layer by layer, we, we moved away from that and it became more, more of its own universe. And uh, you can ask Snore questions um, later about this. Uh, but here you can see some of the, the from going from, from concept, just a lot of concept work to, to have the, the world and the, the storylines come together. Here's one of the characters, Howard Milton. Here you can see the journey we went through, the listening process of, is this professor? But uh, yeah, that's not quite right, that's not quite right. And then when we ended up there to the right, that, that's what he looks like. And uh, that's, a, that's just a, a magical experience that we both have an idea of something or we try to listen and then suddenly uh, he's there. And it's a blessing when you, uh, when all you know how to do is write, and you can see those characters inside, and then one, suddenly one day you meet a guy who can actually draw them. There he is. That's fantastic. And here's uh, the journey from the concept to one of the cards in the game. And uh, we s the way this game works is that we, like I talked about, we, we try to tell a story and how do, you, how do you tell a story where the people playing the game are actually engaged and can, because if you just, that, that's a new thing. You, you used to read a book and that's the story, but in an interactive story, you can somehow influence the story. And anyone who has tried to work with those interactive stories know that there's a good story, that's the one you listen f for, and you can't have people mess up, mess with that story too much. So there's a, there's a difficult, a tricky thing there, that the universe makes sense, we have the characters and there's a storyline, and then you throw players in there and they start messing up that. <laughs> so, but that's nevertheless what we wanted people to do. So that is a very tricky thing, to try to create a, a story that seems like it's branching, but it's not branching too much, or it's not uh, so we use these different, we have two kinds of cards in the game. We have these random cards that happen uh, where we just with a little, uh, an image and a little flavor text, the bomb is designed to kill the passengers, but not the driver, try to throw in a little story nugget that players can combine in different ways. So in this picture you see there's someone who's planted a bomb underneath a carriage and in that story that might pop up at different places, but it's up to the players to make sense of it. And you can play the game without really doing that too much, or you can go all in on the story and, okay, of course that happened because of that. And then we used, uh, to create that story, we have the, these, these storylines. So, like when you read a book or you go to the movies, you play through a story, you play through these, uh, plot points. And the way we solved it or tried to solve it was that each of the plot points have three different outcomes, but they still, they're still linked together in a, in a coherent storyline. So this is one of the stories, the Cape Killer of London is on the loose. So the first thing you do is you, you seek out this shaken victim. And then the story can go three ways from there. Either you try to comfort her and learn something, but either she, your charm is not working magic with her and she cracks up and begins to cry and the next plot point will be a little more difficult or you comfort her a little bit or you, you comfort her really well and she tells you something important. But in either way, the story will continue and you will get to the crime scene. So you will follow the same storyline every time but in three different ways out of each plot card. So uh, that's an example of that, that tricky thing of 
trying to do a, a story that is branching but is actually follows the same storyline. And you can play through this as many times as you want and it will be a little different every time but, but, the, but the, the core of the experience is really that you get together with friends and you play through this and it feels like reading a book or watching a movie. This is what the game looks like when you yeah, unbox it. So you see we have the map of, of London and you lay out all these cards and then the, the mechanic that I, I talked about that we use to force players to work together and prevent this alpha player problem is that little version of Big Ben up there. You see that little clock? So every player will have one of those little clocks and then you press play on the app, it reads a little story in London with a British accent. And then you hear Big Ben go, Dung! and that's when you have 12 minutes to try to flip cards and coordinate and place your tokens. I need you at four o'clock up North London three, but I can't do that because, and that's where you start to, so communication and that, that aspect of the game is what we try to make work and hopefully it, it works. So that was a, a little bit about board games and a, a little of that journey, the way we work, that, uh, that we, we listen for the, for the story and then it's my job to mechanically make that story come through and it's Snow's job to aesthetically make it come through. I hope it was not too confusing. Yeah. Because the last slide is this one. <laughs> 